What's up everybody? I was trying to figure out what to do for this week's video and one of the things that came to mind is that I've learned a lot so far in my journey into calisthenics and body weight fitness and I didn't really have anyone to tell me these things up front and it would have been really useful. So in this video, I'm gonna share 10 tips that I wish someone would have told me when I first started. Okay, the first thing I wanna mention is that every skill is a journey. And what I mean by that is when I first started pursuing like the L-sit and the handstand, those were my, the two skills that I pursued first, I achieved them. I was able to do an L-sit uh, pretty, pretty quickly and the handstand took me a while, but eventually I got it. And what I ended up doing was recording myself with my phone camera. And after I did that, I realized my form wasn't very good. Like I still had room for improvement. Technically, I was holding a handstand, but it was badly arched. I looked like a banana and I was kind of sloppy and I was like waving back and forth trying to keep my balance. So the whole point that I'm trying to make here is that even when you achieve a skill, you're always working to fine tune it and improve on that skill. It's kind of like an artist. If you think about an artist who's maybe a musician and they're creating a composition or a painter making a painting, artists are never happy with the piece that they're working on. They're never 100% satisfied with it. And that's kind of how it is with your skills. You're gonna get the skill and then you're gonna see yourself doing it and be like, oh, I, I can do better than that. And you're always working on it. You're always trying to improve and fine tune it. So treat every skill like a journey and make sure that you celebrate the milestones along the way. All right, tip number two that I wanna share is the concept of progressive overload. And if you're new to fitness in general, then you probably don't know anything about this concept, but it's really popular in calisthenics. Progressive overload is when you progressively make an exercise harder, typically increasing the resistance or the, uh, the explosiveness of it, so that you're making it more challenging and you're by challenging your body more and more, you're gonna force your body to continue adapting and improving. Now there's basically two ways that I recommend applying this in calisthenics. The first way is with progressions. These are exercise variations that are progressively harder. A good example would be if you're working on incline push-ups, so push-ups with your hands elevated, say on your couch or on the stairs or something, and then you move your hands lower to the ground and you start doing your push-ups flat on the floor, by moving your hands lower and changing the angle of leverage, you're actually making it harder. You're increasing the resistance. And this is one way to apply progressive overload. But there's a whole nother way to apply progressive overload. And in my opinion, this is the, the simpler of the two ways and it's the way I recommend doing. And that's weighted basics. What I mean by that is on all the basic upper body exercises like push-ups, pull-ups, dips, if you simply wear a backpack and put stuff in the backpack, you can add weight to the basics. And if you measure the weight and you gradually increase the weight, you will make it harder. That's one way to apply progressive overload and it's really simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. If you guys aren't familiar with that method, check out my video about starting weighted calisthenics without a vest, okay? That's a video I put together to explain how I do that. And it's a really good method for applying progressive overload. Tip number three is all about grip strength. And the reason why I bring up grip strength is because I learned how to muscle up on my outdoor pull-up bar a couple springs ago, maybe, maybe that was last spring, I can't remember. But on my pull-up bar outside, I used a one inch diameter galvanized steel pipe for the bar. So it's, it's a one inch thick bar. And I was able to learn it, it was pretty easy. I mean, it, well, I shouldn't say it was easy, but I, I was able to do muscle ups. And then I went to a fitness park in a nearby town because I don't have one very close. And when I got to that fitness park, they had significantly wider bars. I think they were at least two inches wide, maybe even bigger. And I wasn't able to muscle up. In fact, even my pull-ups were suffering because I was always using a one inch bar and I hadn't developed the grip strength in my forearms and my wrists to really do the same exercises and have the same endurance and strength on the bars there. So I wanted to mention when you're buying, whether it's parallel bars, you know, like a dip station or your pull-up bar or making a pull-up bar, you want to consider the width of the bar because that's going to play into how strong your grip will be. Next is hand placement. And hand placement is really important because as a beginner, it's easy to fall into the habit of always doing standard width 
you know, push-ups like this, pull-ups, shoulder width apart, everything just shoulder width apart typically is uh, what I consider standard. You don't wanna fall into that trap though of always using the same hand placement. The reason why is when you start doing different hand placements, like for instance, wide push-ups with your hands wider than shoulder width, now you're activating different muscles in that exercise, right? You're using more outer chest, you're using more anterior deltoid, even bicep when you do wide push-ups. And then if you bring the push-ups inward to like a, a diamond grip, now you're gonna be working more of your triceps. So you're using the same muscle groups mostly, but you're emphasizing different muscles in that muscle group by changing up your hand placement. So make sure you consider that and you always switch things up even from workout to workout, right from the get-go when you start as a beginner. All right, this one's gonna be tough to explain, so I'll do my best. It's the concept of relative strength. And what that means is, think of it this way. Think of relative strength, like, let's say you weigh this much. It can be any number, uh, 180 pounds, for instance, because I, I work in pounds, I, I talk in pounds because I'm in the United States. And then let's say, that you can do 10 pull-ups at that body weight with no extra weight on you, right? And that's your baseline. But then you start doing weighted basics like I was talking about before, and now you can do 10 pull-ups with five extra pounds, all right? And then 10 extra pounds, and you keep building strength. Before you know it, you're doing 10 pull-ups with 40 pounds on your back, all right? So now you have this difference here. You have your strength is up here, and your body weight is still floating around 180. Okay, maybe you've gained a little bit of muscle, but you've also lost some body fat. So you're floating maybe just a little above 180. And this difference here, this, this gap that it produces, your strength being significantly higher than your body weight, that pound for pound strength, that's relative strength. And that's what's really gonna help you in calisthenics. Having that, that higher relative strength, like pound for pound, that's what helps with all the different skills that you wanna learn. It's about being strong, while being lean. That is, and I'm still learning this, but that is the secret, being lean, but also building strength. Tip number six is about flexibility and mobility. And this is something I made the mistake of neglecting early on. And it got to the point that I was trying to do certain exercises like pike push-ups and L-sits, and I couldn't, not because I didn't have the strength, but because I couldn't even touch my toes. And I don't want that to happen to you. So right from the get-go, Start focusing on stretching. I recommend stretching daily, just a little bit every day, especially in the evenings, like, like right before, uh, like when you're winding down before bed. That's when you're really limber because your body's been moving all day and you're, you're kind of warmed up. You're most limber at that time of day. So if you just do a little bit of stretching, you see gradual improvements and it's really easy to make part of your routine because that's the time of day typically when people are winding down and have the time to stretch. Now, a lot of people talk about mobility as if it's totally different from flexibility, but it's very similar. Mobility is simply the ability to move your joints within that range of motion that you've achieved from your stretching. So aside from stretching, I also recommend just doing basic mobility exercises, simple movements within that range of motion. And if you're having trouble improving your flexibility, I highly recommend foam rolling, okay? Uh, the, the technical term for it is myofascial release, but foam rolling is, is a good way. It's simple because you're gonna use something like this. This is a foam roller. I don't know if you can see that. I'll show, there you go. That's the whole thing. This is a foam roller and I just, I keep one in our bedroom and I like to use it almost every evening before I go to sleep any muscles that feel especially tight, almost to the point that they're painful when you try to stretch, you wanna roll them and that's like getting a massage. It's gonna break up the tissue, break up those knots, improve blood flow so that more nutrients and more blood are getting to the muscle and that's gonna make it easier for you to stretch. It's gonna help it get warmer, get more blood so that you'll actually benefit from the flexibility training that you do. Another thing I like to use besides a foam roller, my wife got me this. This is the same idea, it's for myofascial release, but it's a handheld little, it's called a core massager. And what you can do, if there's a hard place to get, like it's hard to roll your chest on a foam roller, you can use this, if maybe like your internal rotators are really tight, you can roll by hand to really dig into those crevices that are hard to get. And this thing, I also consider this to be a very useful tool. 
So if you're interested in, in what these are and where to get them, I'll put links to the ones I use in the description down below. For the next tip, I recommend to always do your cardio. I can't emphasize that enough, especially for endomorphs. And if you're not familiar with endomorph, ectomorph, and mesomorph, the, the three different somatotypes, stay tuned because I'll be making a video that explains that in the near future. But your body type is basically uh, like how fast your BMR is, like how fast your metabolism is. And that will dictate, you know, how much you should eat, if you, how much cardio you should be doing for your goals. An ectomorph finds it extremely difficult to put on weight. So if an ectomorph is trying to build muscle mass, it's going to be very difficult. Whereas an endomorph like me, I just look at food and I get fat. I mean, that's what it feels like. So for an endomorph like me, it's, it's really easy to put on weight. The hard part is staying lean. So if you're like me, if you're more on the endomorph side of the spectrum and you feel like it's hard to keep the weight off and it's easy to gain weight, always do your cardio. I recommend at least like two or three times a week, even if it's just going out for a walk or doing cardio calisthenics in, in one place, like jumping jacks or mountain climbers or burpees. By doing that, uh, working to lose the extra weight is gonna make it so much easier to do the calisthenics that you wanna learn. You know, any move, like handstand, L-sit, front lever, back lever, all that stuff is gonna be easier with less weight on you. Think of it like weightlifting. If you're at a gym and, and you're a, a personal trainer and you're gonna teach somebody how to do deadlifts, for instance, you're gonna teach them with only the bar. Just the bar, no plates on it. And the reason why is with less weight, it's easier to learn any movement. So the same thing applies to calisthenics. If you're not carrying a lot of extra weight and you're leaner, then everything's going to, just gonna be easier to learn. The next tip also really applies to endomorphs and that is to work out fasted. Now anybody can work out fasted if they want to. Um, for ectomorphs, for the, the naturally very thin people who find it hard to gain weight, this might not be the best advice, but for anyone else, all right, any mesomorphs or endomorphs, people who find it easy to put on weight or, or find it hard to lose weight, then working out fasted is a great idea. You'll actually find that you have more energy when you work out in a fasted state. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, like, wait, I thought food is energy, it's our fuel. So if we eat before a workout, then we'll have more energy. But it doesn't necessarily work that way. In fact, what I believe is happening is through evolution, uh, we've just developed this innate ability to have more energy and more alertness when we're running on empty because we need to seek food. So we, we start producing more adrenal hormones and, and feeling more energetic so we can get that food. And because of that, I have noticed that if I skip breakfast, if I try like an intermittent fasting kind of lifestyle, when I skip breakfast and then I work out right before I break my fast and eat, that fasted workout is, is really great. I, I perform better, I have more energy, I feel lighter, which really helps with calisthenics. So definitely consider giving that a shot, okay? Maybe delaying your breakfast and working out before it. That way you're, you're fasted during your workout and you have more energy. All right, tip number nine is about the concept of straight arm versus bent arm strength. And what I mean by that is there are some skills like handstand, planche, uh, the levers, that focus on arms being locked out at the elbow. That's a straight arm exercise. And then there's exercises like bent arm handstand and the frog stand and other things, you know, dynamic movements like push-ups where you're working on bent arm strength a lot. And those two different types of strength, there's a little bit of translation from one to another, but not completely. So you wanna make sure that you put a roughly even amount of focus on straight arm and bent arm training. So make sure that you, you try to pick and choose your skills and exercises in a way that you're you're working on straight arm stuff as much as you're working on bent arm stuff. All right, tip number 10 is, are you feeling any pain? If so, stop, all right? That's the gist of it. And the story behind this is that when I started working on handstand push-ups and I was doing a lot of overhead pressing, I started to get a pain in my left shoulder. Uh, there was a lot of like popping when I would rotate it and uh, this pinching feeling started to happen during the workouts and then it would translate to this sharp, um, this sharp soreness afterwards when I was healing. And I knew something was wrong. So I ended up talking to a physical therapist that I know and a chiropractor. 
and I found out what I had was something called an impingement. Now, I don't want to go off on a tangent about shoulder impingement, but what I will say is that I had a muscular imbalance impacting my posture, and it just, my shoulder joint was not working correctly. So by doing certain exercises to strengthen my upper back and to stretch my chest, I was able to work through that and continue working on my overhead pressing. The point is, if I would have continued, I could have really injured my shoulder. I could have done some permanent damage to it. So you want to make sure that if you start feeling any pain during your workouts, stop. Just stop what you're doing and make a note of which exercise was causing pain. Go find a physical therapist or someone who knows about this stuff, find out what's going on and work to improve it. If you try to push through the pain, chances are you're going to wind up with a long-term injury and that's a bad thing. So I know this was a different kind of video. Usually, like lately, I've been making a ton of tutorials with a, a lot of different shots and exercises and voiceovers and stuff. But this week I felt like doing something different, just talking to you guys, talking directly to the camera. And you know, when I was thinking about the topic, I thought a lot of my viewers are beginners. I know that for sure, because I've asked you guys before. And also there's a bunch of advice that I wish I would have been given when I first started. So I figured why not share that with you? And if there's anything I shared, any of the 10 tips in this video that you want to learn more about, please let me know down below in the comments, all right? I could make an entire video about any of these 10 tips. And for those of you who are new to my channel, minus the gym, it's all about fitness and nutrition that you can actually apply in a normal, busy life, like, like how I have. All right, and the fitness is calisthenics-based home fitness, all right? I'm not a calisthenics athlete who's, who's trying to, to you know, win some competition or anything. I'm actually a husband and a father and I, I have a, a busy schedule and a full-time job. I'm just trying to share everything I've learned and trying to help people out. So if that sounds good to you, the subscribe button is right down below. Make sure you tap that bell icon too. That way when you tap the bell, YouTube will notify you every time I upload. All right? And with that said, I will see you in the next video.